Welcome to Speak for Yourself. Oh, God, I gotta admit something. I'm Marcel Swally. Um, wow, that is amazing over there. That's Emmanuel Emmy Acho looking the part today, bro. Speak on it. Come on. Speak so, what does that mean? I look every other day, so. Not like that. Not that good. <laughs> That is a suit. My dog. What do I look like? I sell suit fabric, I said. <laughs> oh, God, I look a mess today. Anyway, I'm going to make it up by what I'm going to say. It's time for reward performance. Talk to you by Capital One. <laughs> What's in your wallet? Nothing in mine. <laughs> I got them crumbs. We're a week away from the Cowboys getting the season started against the defending champion Bucks. Oh, but that crush got his expected ready to go. He's ready, but he has not played a game since last October due to injuries. Our own Troy Aikman said, quote, do I think those injuries are a concern? I really don't. That's right, Troy. So, Acho, are you confident Dak will be ready for the matchup with the ball? I'm not confident, Sal, and I don't think we have any reason to be confident. Now, it's not because I'm a pessimist. I'm just realistically looking at the information we have been given. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's start here. Let me take y'all into the behind the scenes. The difference between us, hopefully, at the desk and you viewing is that we have some real world experience at a higher level of what we're talking about. Oh, you're now, higher. There huh? are higher levels. For example, your level was higher of mine, and I'm sure somebody's was higher than yours. Well, but hopefully, we got a higher level of experience. Let's go. So, when I tore my MCL completely in college, second degree actually, it was completely in the league, uh, for, uh, second degree in college, mm. I came back two weeks later with the knee brace on, but I was always questioning the moves I was making because mm. I knew if I get hit in that knee, there might be some pain. Hell yeah. I tear my MCL in the my first year in Cleveland, blow it out completely against the Green Bay Packers. I get cut blocked, ah, knee gone. <laughs> when I came back the following season, obviously I was healthy based upon an MRI, based upon a doctor's note, but I was always cautious about offensive linemen coming towards my knee. You at home, you may not every have played play, in the league. Every moment? Not, not every play, not okay. every moment. Early just, on. Just clarify. Early on. Okay, okay. Now, even if you ain't playing in the league, you know after you get injured, there is a very early period of time where you question the injury. Mm. There's a period early in time where you like, man, I don't know if I can trust it anymore. Just the psychologic, the psychology of it all. Mm. So I'm not confident Dak will be ready because I'm not confident Dak is confident he'll be ready. Mm. If you ask him, hey, Dak, you ready for the Bucks? Oh, you already know I am. You know, I've been putting in a lot of work, been doing <laughs> grinding all offseason. Yeah. But still, just wait until uh, inside linebacker Devin White blitzes up the middle and is diving towards Dak's ankle. Because remember, the last hit Dak Prescott took was the hit that landed him on a cart being carted off the field. Like, really put that in context, yeah? right. oh. Put that in context, y'all. The last time Dak Prescott got hit, he ended up on a cart with a towel in his mouth, getting carted off the football field, tears in his eyes, and mm. a fist raised up. Mm. That's his last memory of contact. So his first memory this season of contact is going to have to draw from what happened last year. For that reason, I'm not confident that even Dak's subconscious is ready for the matchup. Okay, I am totally confident in Dak Prescott week one. Um, I'm going to go into the same context you did, my, my own experience, my playing experience. First of all, you just called Troy Aikman a lie because Troy Aikman agrees with me and we both were confident What's in Troy him. Say? Troy, what did Troy say? You heard the setup. Troy said, yeah, the injury, not a concern. But to you, it is a concern. It's not a concern to me as well. I'll show you are a pessimist. I, I worked with you over a year. I was waiting to really, like, stamp that on you. You know I've thrown it out there a couple times, and you responded properly at those times. But you continue to invade my space of positivity <laughs> with your pessimism. So now you are a pessimist, okay? I know why you're a pessimist, because I can hear it come out of every scenario that you're presented with that is either half empty or half full. You always say it's half empty. And it's interesting why you go there. You were, what did a, what did a, what team interviewed you? Oh, I can't say that on there. Okay. <laughs> then they ask you, weren't you from a nuclear family? Yes, then sir. they ask you, did you have a great upbringing? Yes, sir. Then you have the three car garage. <laughs> <laughs> then they ask you all those kind of questions, you huxtable. And now you come up here and be a pessimist after all that good upbringing you had. This is what Acho does, everyone. I have to look at the camera for this one. Acho is a creator of doubt. Now, how do you create doubt? I tell everyone, if you want to move the masses, whisper to one. That's how you create doubt. You ain't gonna move this whole stadium of people to believe what Acho is saying unless you grab one and say, I don't know if Dak right. And then he looks at Dak, and Dak is just chilling. Dak is fine. Dak is thinking, like you said, Dak, are you ready for the Bucks? Absolutely. Oh, I don't know. He, last year when they asked him, he said, absolutely. And this year, eh, absolutely. You're creating doubt. 
There is no doubt with Dak Prescott. Let me tell you why. If you look at Dak Prescott last year before injury, what was he on pace to do? Beat NFL records Sir. in the passing game. Okay, when it comes back to muscle memory, you keep saying, Devin White's coming at you. Muscle memory isn't just about the last play that you took, the last snap that you had before injury. Muscle memory goes all the way back to the banks of your confidence, to the banks of the depth of your belief in yourself. And you know what Dak knows? That not only do I believe in myself, but this organization believes in me. Dak is no longer playing under the pressure of trying to get his money, trying to get his stripes. Dak was given what he was deserving. Now it's about proving. Now it's about earning. Now it's about showing. I've been through those. You've been through those. The pressure of getting up the mountain versus the pressure of just staying at the top of the mountain because they already think you're at the apex. Dak Prescott, healthy, like Troy Aikman says. Dak Prescott, confident, like we know he is. And Dak Prescott may be on NFL historical pace at the beginning of the season, just like he was last year. So the problem is Dak Prescott is like the individual that gets cheated on. He got trust issues. Oh. He gonna have trust issues, Sal. Why? Because okay. I wouldn't necessarily trust my ankle just yet. Whenever somebody betrays you and Dak Prescott's body, figuratively speaking, in that game, it did betray him because up until that point, he had been healthy for five straight seasons, four seasons, and four games. Uh. Whenever somebody or something betrays you, mm. all of a sudden, you will doubt that thing. So if I came up to studio one day, sat in this chair, and it collapsed under me, I would question the nachos I ate the night before. <laughs> <laughs> but after that, <laughs> right. I would question before I sit in the chair at least the very next day, mm. is it good? Is it good? Is it stable? I feel you. We good? Okay. Because an inanimate object can betray you, just like a human being can betray you, just like your body can betray mm. you. So Dak Prescott's body betrayed him, again, figuratively speaking. Obviously, Which, there was contact that led to that injury. Mm -hmm. So at a minimum, cell, like all individuals, because we've all been betrayed by somebody or something at some point in time, you don't have trust issues. Okay. And as I look at it going into this game, mm. Dak Prescott will have trust issues at least for a series two or three. Mm. Now, it does not help, Sel, mm. that Dak Prescott is going up against the best trio of linebackers as it pertains to mm. accruing sacks. Okay. Devin White, outside linebacker Jason Pierre-Paul, outside linebacker Shaq Barrett. Shaq Barrett, 13 and a half sacks on average. Peace. The last two years. So it does not help that you have something that is going to put tension on what you already have a trust issue for. So if, you know what I'm saying? I oh, don't you do you it. You know what I'm saying? No, I don't know if, what you're saying. If, I'm, if, I'm married. If, if, if a dude <laughs> maybe steps out on a significant other, you X, like Kanye Y, and Z. Kim? You heard about that one? But X, Y, and Z reasons. Kanye is really Christian now. And the dude might turn around and, you know, I'm changed. I'm a changed man. I'm a changed man. Yeah. But I would assume his partner would have an issue with him going to the club late at night with his boys, yeah. going on a boys' trip to Vegas. Why? Because a boys' trip to Vegas or the club late at night will yeah. put tension or yeah. stress yeah. on that which yeah. I already have an issue with. Yeah. You don't think Devin White, mm. Jason Pierre-Paul, Shaq Barrett, they're going to put tension, stress, pressure mm. on what Dak Prescott already has a trust issue with? You know how it is. You've been there. If you ain't been there, I've been there. Of course, no, I trust you. No, I do. Go ahead. Go have fun. Mm. No, that's all good. Don't even worry about it. Yeah. Just text me. Just let me know before you go to sleep. But in the back of your head, you wonder, I wonder if, the, if, if, if this going to hold up. I wonder what they got shaking. I wonder what mm. they doing. That Prescott, mm. of course I feel good. Mm. I feel great, Coach. Mm. Coach McCarthy, it's like Zeke. Mm. We good, baby. CD. I got talk. you, Amari. It's talk. all good. Why your hey, bass and your voice is like back out here? Tyron Smith, let's do it, boys. <laughs> we going to the Super Bowl this year. <laughs> But in the back of Dak's head, he's like, oh, God, if I take one hit the wrong <laughs> way, it might be back on that card again. Mm. Like this. Oh, man. <laughs> there ain't nothing worse than this. <laughs> Shut up. Yeah, like, this is Dak's first rodeo. Like, this is the first time Dak ever been injured. That take was amazing. But come on, man. We been... I got hurt when I was nine years old, dog. I got carted off like this, but they ain't have a carter. It's just the homies picking me up. <laughs> like this. I'm nine years old with a sprained knee playing Pop Warner. Don't act like Dak ain't been there before. Dak has resurrected himself from many down situations. Um... It is funny when you get that, hey, baby, call me before you go to sleep. I'm like, if I'm on the East Coast, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. Let's get real into this. <laughs> Let's stop there. Y'all catch that later. Um, Dak Prescott is confident in himself. Why? Because who is he going against? 
Like, you keep talking about that chair and an inanimate object. Mm -hmm. Okay, respect that. Now, we know that there's going to be some animation on this field when you're going against the Tampa Bay Bucks defense. But the beautiful thing about football is you can't judge a book by its cover. True. The cover of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers reads like this. Super Bowl champions returning everyone and a hell of a defense. Mm. Now, let's look deeper into that book. Shall we? You usually look deeper into that book, you realize, oh, there are some issues with that defense. You look into that book and you start to realize, oh, they were 20th in red zone defense last year, 21st in pass defense last year. Hmm. Wonder what the Dallas Cowboys were when Dak was healthy last time on the field. Number one in terms of passing offense. Number one ranked offense. Do you know that four of the five losses that happened last year to the defense of the Tampa Bay Bucks were to offenses ranked in the top 12? Whoa. Do you know that no quarterback has averaged more passing yards the last two years than Dak Prescott? Whoa. You start to add this up, you start to get some confidence in that chair. You start to sit down like, oh, okay. I'm not scared of no chair. Chair better be scared of me. Now, I look at some of these losses. I look at some of these games where the defense didn't look so stellar. You see a Patrick Mahomes at quarterback. You see a Drew Brees. You see a Justin Herbert. You say, okay, I understand that when they lit him up. But Matt Ryan? Dak Prescott. Matt Ryan lit him up? Matt Ryan went for 356, three touchdowns, 110 rating? Mm. Jared Goff lit him up, 376, three touchdowns? Hmm. Two picks. Um, is Dak Prescott better than Jared Goff? Hell yeah. Is he better than Matt Ryan? Uh, we got a conversation. Mm -hmm. Point being, there is a lot of ammunition, a lot on the resume that gives Dak Prescott confidence against this team. Because this team, as great as it is, champions they are, is still not perfect. Here's what's interesting, though, Cell. We spent the first 11 minutes in my part talking about the ankle injury and your part talking about Dak Prescott's offense and the Buccaneers and their deficiencies. We ain't even talked about the most pressing issue. The issues with down The shoulder. Oh, stop. Hey, man, you, did you hear Troy Aikman? Why are we doing this? He had an MRI twice. He's good. He's clear. If the shoulder caused such an issue that he couldn't practice. If they didn't know what was going on with the ish shoulder, thus they had to MRI him not mm. once, but let me MRI him again to mm. assure that the shoulder is good. Remember when Terry Bradshaw asked before the Hall of Fame game, Dak Prescott, wait a second, so was the shoulder injury actually under the shoulder, et cetera, et cetera? And Dak just kind of Mr. Politician avoided the answer because I don't think the doctors were well aware, as we found out on Hard Knocks, where the injury was? The cell. You can't be confident because he's been on a pitch count. He's been on a pitch count all training camp. And now you're going to go from being on a pitch count straight into a game with live bullets against the best team last year, yeah. returning everybody? Even if we disregard the ankle, disregard the Buccaneers' pass rush, disregard the offensive line for the Cowboys bringing back three players who missed a majority of time last year, disregard all of that. I'm listening. You still have a shoulder issue and a shoulder injury that has not yet been tested and has not yet been proven to be healthy. Mm. Okay, you wanted to do that. Um, back to that cheating stuff you were talking about earlier and not believing. Um, 21 Savage had a good line on that. He said, don't risk home for a hotel. Y'all got to know this, fellas out there. Don't risk home for a hotel. Interesting line. All right, let's get back to this. <laughs> Kanye should have heard that. Um, here's, here's, let's go back to that. And Donda is bang banging. Me and you going to have a fight over Donda. I like Donda. He doesn't. Kanye, he, right here. Enemy. Hey, um, let's talk about what we're skipping over. Because you keep trying to go to the double MRI saying, oh, my, they didn't even know what was wrong with Dak. Wasn't that, bruh. They didn't want to share what was wrong with Dak. And it was probably more severe than they led on. But obviously, it was something that they didn't have too much of a concern with. Because you wouldn't go cross town to the Texas Rangers, let them out it, and they don't have a conversation about his injury unless you had that under control. Let's be real about that. I want to talk about the dynamic that is really going to compromise this game more so than Dak and his injuries. And, like, no football player has ever been hurt before and can't respond from injury. You did. You, you had a grade 2 MCL, mm -hmm. came back, then got a grade 3 MCL, mm -hmm. and still played after that, did you not? Mm -hmm. Okay. I got a grade 1 right now. Stepped on my son's little Hot Wheel one day. <laughs> Seriously, got a grade 1. Here's the thing about it. Tampa Bay Buccaneers, their greatest enemy is not going to wear a different uniform. It's going to be wearing the same colors as them. Mm -hmm. It's the fact that they won a championship. It's the fact that they may be thinking of skipping a step. Why? We just won a championship. Everybody's back. We got the greatest leader in team sports history. Do we really need to, like, start at square one? And 
Your subconscious is a believer. Your subconscious is going to sit there and say, man, all offseason, we heard we are the ones. All offseason, we got the greatest defense. All offseason, man, we got Tom Brady going for number eight. Are you going to listen to the signal or are you going to listen to the noise? Because before you know it, that ball is going to get kicked off. Dallas offense is going to be ready to score. Dallas defense has looked good this preseason so far. You're going to realize not only are you fighting the Dallas Cowboys and the star, you're fighting all of the greatness that you had behind you. But you still got to go brick by brick to have it in front of you. Joined now by the man who will be on that call tonight, Fox College football analyst, our man, Joe Black. Joe, we're excited about college football being back, and welcome to the show. So let's start where you are, and let's start with this game right here, number four, Ohio State. The Buckeyes have won four straight Big Ten titles. Who is the biggest threat to ending Ohio State's dominance in the Big Ten? Man. That's a good question because I, I don't see a threat really in sight. You know, the top of college football, and this is true not just in the Big Ten, guys, but it's true across college football. Clemson has, has totally separated themselves out from the ACC. Oklahoma has done similar things in the Big 12. Uh, Alabama, you could say, has done that uh, not only to the SEC, but really maybe even to the country, winning six of the last 12 national championships. It speaks to the top-heavy na uh, top nature of the sport. If there is a team that I'm high on in the Big 10, though, it's Wisconsin. We're going to see them on Saturday against Penn State. That's a heck of an opener. They're going to get them at home, which is going to help, but they're going to be very tough on defense, and if Graham Mertz, their quarterback, can play like he did to start last season versus the way that he finished last season, then they could have a heck of a team. I think they're going to have a solid running game, and then they'll be more explosive in the passing game than they've been in the past. So if you're asking me who's the best uh, potential threat, I think it's the Wisconsin Badgers. Mm, I like it. Now, Clat, you know you're my guy, college football. You know it's my sport, so let's talk. You don't get a second chance. At a first impression. Now, Texas has a new head coach. Clemson has a new quarterback. Ohio yep. State has a new quarterback. LSU was in the dregs of the SEC last year. Who needs to make a good first impression this weekend? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a great question. And actually, you mentioned the, the team that I was thinking about coming into this. I think it's LSU. Now, granted, they've got some serious circumstances that are way bigger than football that, that are surrounding their program right now, right? And the entire region. And obviously our hearts and, and prayers go out to everybody in the Gulf region that's been affected by the hurricane. Having said that, the way that they won the championship two years ago with a historically great team, and then the way that they fell off the face of the planet last year uh, at LSU, this is a monster year for Ed Ogeron. And they open up in a really tough game. Not environment, didn't say environment, game, right? Because mm -hmm. I don't think the Rose Bowl is going to pose some sort of hostile environment to LSU. In fact, there might be more LSU fans than there are UCLA fans. But that run game for UCLA is pretty potent. And if Dorian Thompson-Robinson plays well, then or better than he did last week, then, then I think that this could be a game late. And you never know where the mindset is of those LSU Tigers. Uh, they got a new quarterback. It's Brad Johnson, Johnson's son, Max. Uh, I, I think that this is a, a tough opener, and this team has to have some success early in the year or else people are going to be wondering, is Ed Ogeron the guy who won the national championship or is he the guy that's been fairly middling for the rest of his career? Yeah, I think uh, my former coach and Marcellus's former coach, Chip Kelly, will actually give LSU all they can handle this time around. But let's talk about the coach of my former team, Coach Sark. Yeah. And I'd be remiss mm -hmm. if I didn't ask you about him. Marcellus knows him well, former neighbors. Uh, <laughs> but, Clat, what do you expect to see from Sark in Texas, not only in the opener, but what are your expectations this year? So I, I'm high on Sark and Texas, okay? Um, I think this was a great hire, and, and people can talk all they want about what happened at USC, but remember, that was, that was a personal struggle for that individual, Steve Sarkeesian, okay? That, I don't think that that was an indictment of what he is as a coach, and I think that you can separate the two out. I've talked with a lot of players and people who have coached with Sark, and they all vouch for him, and, and they say if he's right, personally guy's a heck of a coach his track record suggests as such remember now he took over an, an, a winless washington team okay so washington was 0 and 12 the year before sark got there they hadn't had a winning season since all the way back when rick neuheisel was the coach so they had been kind of a an, an average fo college football program for the better part of a decade he got there immediately made them better made them a winning program took them to bowl games and ultimately built the foundation that then chris peterson used to take that organization that program to the playoff 
he's that guy, right? And and I think that he has learned personally how to deal with the things that he needs to deal with. He has learned from great coaches now, being a part of Nick Saban's staff. He, he put together a terrific staff at Texas. He's got a very talented roster, and I know that they're very high on their new quarterback, Hudson Card. Talented kid. And then here's the kicker. And, Acho, I know this is the one that you're going to love. Bajan Robinson might be the best player in college football. Hey, right? Like, hey. he is Marcellus. He's that dude, man. I'm like, <laughs> give him the ball dude, 20 times, you. and we might be talking about a double digit win season for the Longhorns. Yes, sir. Okay, respect to that. Uh, we weren't supposed to talk Texas football. It's not on the script because we're only going to talk about the top teams. But okay, I love Mr. Sarge. You I knew love that was coming, though. I, I didn't see it on my question. I was like, I almost looked at my phone like, wait, that question wasn't yeah. in there, but yeah, I knew yeah. it was coming. Oh, Wi Fi working in this state. Stadium, but uh, that said, um, uh, Otto talked about it earlier, and the uh, young quarterbacks, first-year quarterbacks in terms of starting opportunities at Clemson, Alabama, Ohio State, even Notre Dame. Of those schools, which one do you have the most belief in? Well, I, I have the most belief, and it's not because of this guy as an individual, although he's very talented, but I have the most belief in C.J. Stroud for Ohio State that we'll see here tonight. And here's why. Again, this is nothing against those other individuals. I just think C.J. Stroud has a better supporting cast than anybody else, right? Like, like Bryce Young at Alabama, he's a hell of a player, but look at what they're trying to replace, right? So he's going to be playing with a lot of unproven players. That's tough to do as a quarterback. D.J. Uyunglele no longer has Travis Etienne, who was the ACC's all-time leading rusher, right? So, I mean, that's, that's difficult to do. Meanwhile, C.J. Stroud tonight, guys, when you watch this game tonight, He's playing behind an offensive line that over the course of their career as a whole, these five guys may earn a quarter of a billion dollars in NFL contracts. Mm -hmm. Like they're, mm -hmm. I think, potentially the best offensive line in college football. They've got a, a four man deep running back rotation with a guy that a lot of people in college football circles are the most excited about of any young freshman, Travion Henderson. Can't wait to see him tonight. They've got the best core of wide receivers led by Chris Olave and then a, a stable of five-star number one wide receivers in the country, including Marvin Harrison Jr., who's an absolute stud. Uh, they've got potentially the best tight end in the country in Jeremy Ruckert. He could be the Mackey Award winner. So if you're asking me, like, which quarterback might impress? I'm like, give me that car. Give me the keys to that car, and I'll impress you. Like, I think I could play quarterback for Ohio State tonight and do pretty well, although C.J. Stroud's going to do much better. So I have a lot of faith that C.J. Stroud's going to have a big year and turn into a huge star. Hey, Clat, you making Marcellus feel old, man, because you mentioned Brad Johnson's son. Stop. And then you mentioned Marvin Harrison Jr. I already make him feel right. old because I got a full head of hair, but Clack, guys, you ain't got to right? add insult to injury, right, my right. guy. Oh, my God. Um, Clack, you mentioned a lot of stars, so let's talk big picture. For those that are loose college football fans, who do you think should be or will be the Heisman favorite heading into the season? Okay, so my Heisman favorite, favorite is the Oklahoma quarterback, Spencer yeah, Rattler. Rattler. Haven't mentioned him yet because he's an experienced guy, and I think that's going to pay dividends for him. That Oklahoma team, they might be the most complete OU team since dating back to 2008. Uh, and, Acho, you remember those OU teams with Gerald McCoy up front yep. on the defensive side, Sam Bradford as their quarterback, Jermaine Gresham as, as the tight end. They're deep like that this year because they can actually play defense. I think this is a team that could potentially run the table if he puts up up OU style numbers from the quarterback position we've already seen what happens to the quarterback at that program for Lincoln Riley what happens well Baker won the Heisman Kyler Murray won the Heisman Jalen Hurts finished second like he's going to be in that vein so my favorite for that trophy is going to be Spencer Rattler the QB for OU okay well since Acho took us there to the bottom tier teams uh unranked Michigan let's start there opens up against Western Michigan this weekend and we know the big star of their team is actually their coach and Jim Harbaugh still looking for his Big Ten title heading into his seventh season in Ann Arbor is this for real a make or break <laughs> year for Harbaugh so I read that question and I and I started thinking I'm like well yeah every year it's amazing and then I thought I started thinking to myself and you I would love your guys' thoughts on this too can can it be a make or break year if there's no expectations? Mm. Because for the first time in my career doing this job, like there's no, there's no expectations around Michigan. Guys, mm. I it's eerily like 
quiet around the Wolverines right now. They're going to go with Cade McNamara as their quarterback. There's no expectations. They're not talking about trying to beat Ohio State. They're not talking about Jim Harbaugh getting to the playoff. They, they gave him a new contract extension that really wasn't an extension because it cut his salary in half, unheard of in college football, in particular in a year in which Jimbo Fisher just signed a deal that's going to extend mm -hmm. him at $9 million a year. So, I mean... <clears throat> But Clat, let I, I me don't ask know you. If it's a, I, I think that the fan base for Michigan is setting themselves up to be okay mentally if they're mm. eight and four. But how how bad is that? Because I'm just a college football fan. Mm -hmm. I like when big programs right. do big things. USC, Penn State, Ohio State, Bama, Clemson, Michigan, Notre Dame. College football is better when the big programs are bigger. How does that make you feel as a college football fan talking about Michigan in a, well, you know, they're just going to concede to losing to Ohio State, concede to going 8-4? Yeah. and four. What's that mean for the sport? Well, it's, it's not good. I mean, I, I think that the sport obviously would love to have the Wolverines at the top level. The Big Ten would love to have the Wolverines at the top level. And this is not a knock, but, like, it makes me feel kind of like I felt for a decade about Texas, mm -hmm. right? Like, <laughs> can you really? please join yeah. the party the University of Texas, right? And and we've been waiting and waiting. There was one year they made that rush to the Sugar Bowl and, and played great with Sam Ellinger. Uh, but, you know, those those two programs, and, and then to a lesser extent maybe, but equally in that conversation is USC. Yep. You know, those three programs have got to at some point rise up and say we're going to compete with the big boys. The, the big boys have clearly separated themselves out. Okay, when you look at the teams that are in the top five in the AP right now and you add Notre Dame, guess what you see? You see every playoff representative in the last four years except for one. LSU is the only program that had a playoff berth outside of the current top five in Notre Dame in the last four seasons. That's not good for college football. Mm. We need to spread this out a little bit. So I'm calling on you, Texas <laughs> and Michigan and USC. You guys have, have got to get better. And, and I think, that, you know, it speaks to the point. The sport is better when there's a little bit more parity and we get a, a little bit more national in our scope rather than kind of the regional centric uh, college football that we've had over the last decade. All right, Clat, you're calling programs out. I got to call you out because oh. you reasonably put out your top five college oh. football helmets oh. and it's no surprise. You have your oh, Colorado yes, that's, Buffaloes. There's no flaws in that it, ranking. <laughs> mm, let's see, let's no see. No flaws, no bias. He got his Buffaloes ahead mm. of my Longhorns, and he has Notre Dame, mm. Michigan, Alabama. Marcellus, mm. I don't know if Columbia had football helmets or if y'all Don't do that. It, but uh -uh. I need you to settle wow. the debate, <laughs> Sal. Yeah. Where school got the nicer helmets, man? Well, Texas in the Ivy League, we pride ourselves of actually owning the companies that make the helmets. Um, <laughs> let's say this. <laughs> I got to disagree with this ranking right here. I love me some Colorado. Growing up, that was my school. Texas has the best colors, but the best uniform, best helmet is not even on here. It's Penn State. It's not even a conversation. Oh. So, yeah, Penn State's number one to me. But out of Colorado and Texas, I, I got to go Texas over that. My dog. Mm-hmm. Oh, man, that's that's rough. Well, listen, I, uh, that might have been a little biased on my part, right? Because <laughs> you guys have to you have to understand, I'm, I'm five years old. My dad gets some tickets to go see the University of Colorado play Brian Bosworth's Oklahoma team in Boss, 1986 man. in Folsom Field. Man. I fell in love with the sport. I saw the Buffalo run. Like, it was my dream ever since. I'm living my dream now, being a part of college football. So that helmet is always going to be special to me. I got to wear it. Uh, so it's, it's definitely... Definitely, it's definitely biased. Don't There's cry. no doubt. Penn State, by the way, I don't, I don't know about Penn State. Great uni, bad helmet. Great uni, there it bad is. helmet. I can there, take there that. There it is. The Kajana Carter jersey, like you said when you were five years old, as a youngster, that Kajana Carter jersey did some things to me. Well, thanks, Joel, and have a great there call tonight, big dog. All right, Clat. My man. <laughs> Love it. Great talking with you guys. Have a good afternoon. Yes, sir. Lamar Jackson's Ravens have the third best odds to win the AFC, according to Fox Best Sportsbook. Defensive end Calais Campbell, my dog, said there's no excuses this season. Really? Adding, quote, this team is just set up perfectly to make a run. Let me say it like Calais. Make a run. So, Acho, <laughs> are Lamar's Ravens out of excuses this season? Yeah, big dog, they've been out. Uh, and I'm honestly more eager to hear what you have to say because you are the one who currently has the burden of 
proving excuses. Because <laughs> um, to me, they're out. Yeah. You have a Super Bowl head coach. Okay. You have a unanimous MVP talent at quarterback. Mm -hmm. You have a first-round pick at wide receiver this year, mm -hmm. a first-round pick at wide receiver from two years ago, plus a Belintikoff Award finalist, Belintikoff Award finalist at wide receiver you drafted in the fourth round okay. this year. Mm -hmm. You still have a stable of running backs, even with J.K. Dobbins Almost. out. You have a third-round pick at tight end, Mark Andrews, one of the best all-around tight ends in, like, his third or fourth year in the league. So... I can't find no excuses, at least not offensively. Now, defensively, you already know what they have up front. Calais Campbell, who was flirting with the Hall of Fame. I think he has 96 and a half sacks. Yeah. You know how just, just how hard that is to acquire. You got defensive backs. You got uh, Marcus Peters. But then more importantly than that, you got lockdown backs on, lockdown DBs on the other side of the field. Hmm. I see no excuse, not from the coaching position. Not from the personnel position, not from the youth position. Everything you need in a football team, the Ravens allegedly have. Now they just got to put it together. Okay. Um, I have never made excuses for this team. Uh, they do strike something in me that no other team that I didn't play for strikes in me. Like, I'm a fan of all the four teams I paid for. And then there's one other team out there I just endear. I just love me some Baltimore Ravens. I'll give you that. Um, however, you got to give me this. We can't let story get in the way of reality. Okay. Okay, in our world, story is, oh, who's your quarterback? You're going to win it all. Reality is, what's your team look like? Sure. That's who's going to win it all. In story, you start to say the Baltimore Ravens has a Super Bowl winning coach, and they got all these weapons, and they're going to win it all. In reality... We got to start talking about the injuries. We got to talk about the disastrous offseason and preseason they've had. J.K. Dobbins, is he there this year? No, nah, he gone now. What about Marlon Humphrey? Is he dealing with a growing injury? That's reality. What about Miles Boykin? Hamstring. Rashad Bateman, we just drafted you. You already had growing surgery? How do you think he's going to perform? You talk about trusting yourself. How does a rookie trust himself when he just had growing surgery? Where's Orlando Brown? Is he in Baltimore anymore? Nah, he's over there helping Patrick Mahomes in Kansas City. Oh, but the story is we got Sammy Watkins. What was that, the fourth best receiver from Kansas City? And we drafted well. Who's going to turn into something? We start at the top of Rashad Bateman, question marks, because of the injury. So we're letting the story get in the way of the reality. I know one thing that's constant in life, especially football, change. <laughs> and I know that the Baltimore Ravens are going to be a good team. I know the Baltimore Ravens are going to be scratching at being a great team. But are they out of excuses? No. Because here are the reasons why they have excuses. Look at this team. It's a Ferrari on three flats. How fast is it going? Ah, not too fast until they call triple A. This team right now, I don't know how they're going to start because they still have the unanimous MVP of Lamar Jackson. And that's pretty much all you need to a degree. But he has to have resources around him, big dog, or there's still going to be excuses made. I love your first sentence. I hate your second sentence of the last two sentences. Okay, let me hear. He should be all you need. Here's why they're out of excuses. Look at the NFL, Sal. Mm. Any team that has a MVP at the quarterback position, a former MVP at the quarterback position, plus a Super Bowl winning head coach, that team you would say could win the Super Bowl. Put it up. Whether it is Tom Brady, Bruce Arians. Let's go. Whether it is Patrick Mahomes, Andy Reid. Just give me MVP quarterback and a competent head coach. Aaron Rodgers, Matt LaFleur. Give me MVP quarterback and a competent... Oh, Matt Ryan doesn't yet have proven to have a competent head coach. So you can't tell me that if Tom Brady, Patrick Mahomes, MVPs with Super Bowl winning head coaches, and we know they ain't got no excuses, mm. or Aaron Rodgers, MVP and a competent head coach, you know he ain't got an excuse, mm -hmm. then how can you make the excuse for Lamar Jackson, a unanimous MVP? Mind yeah, you, he was yeah. a greater MVP than all those MVPs based on the MVP award, and he has a Super Bowl head coach, and in all honesty, he probably has more talent of skill, at least in Aaron Rodgers. You know, Aaron Rodgers got uh, his beast in Tay Adams, but if you look in it, who the Ravens have based on how much capital they have allocated, mm. Hollywood Brown. Come on, Rashad man. Bateman. And, and come on now. Still? Rashad Bateman has not had one snap. He hasn't in had NFL, a snap. And he has one leg right sure, now. Sure, but here's my question. <laughs> Come on, man. If these dudes we know are dudes, because Hollywood Brown was a dude in college. In, in NFL yet? No. Oh, but doesn't Lamar true. Jackson have to take some blame for that? Oh, no, I can't. Because Devontae Adams wasn't like that coming out of college. No. But all of a sudden with Aaron Rodgers, he's the greatest receiver right now in the league, or DeAndre Hopkins, depending on what side of the, 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 the ledger you fall yeah, yeah. on. But what if he went down? What well, would you look at Aaron Rodgers? Would he have an excuse? Because who's the best receiver for the Ravens right now? 
Good luck. <laughs> Sammy, I love Sammy Watkins' talent. He just can't stay healthy, so he can't stay at the top of the depth chart. Then you start talking about Rashad Bateman. Dog, you was a beat. E oh, God, Lord. You got I tore my groin off the bone and didn't need surgery. And I retired that year after that because I was like, dog, this is a difference maker. It affects your hip, your knee. Everything just gets out of alignment. I'm not wishing any of this on this young man. But I have no idea what Rashad Bateman is going to do coming back from this growing surgery as a rookie. OK, let's say that. Hollywood Brown, that's your best receiver? No, your best receiver is a tight end. It's still Mark sure. Andrews. Come on, man. But here's, so, here's, here's my pushback. Here's my pushback. Push push. Because this is what I think Ravens fans, eventually you will have to walk by a mirror. You can choose to look at yourself <laughs> in it. But eventually you're going to have to walk by one. I encourage you when you walk by to stop mm. and look at yourself. Square up. Aaron Rodgers has been begging for a first-round pick wide receiver. He's never had one. No. They've never drafted a first-round skill position since Aaron Rodgers has taken over. Oh, except Jordan Love, Aaron Rodgers' replacement. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the Baltimore Ravens drafted a first-round pick wide receiver in 18. You draft a, in 19. You draft a first-round pick wide receiver this year, and then you draft another wide receiver in the fourth round who's actually probably just as good as your first-round pick. He just tore his ACL, and thus he missed some time. His junior year of college, if I'm not mistaken, Tylen Wallace, please look him up. He is a dude. So at that point, Sal, if Aaron Rodgers is begging for what Lamar Jackson has been given freely and really? excessively in these first-round pick wide receivers and these first-round talents, then I can't find an excuse for Lamar. I can't do well, it. Well, look, uh, if you ever bought a product and then got that email talking about the recall, uh, Lamar got a couple emails about the recall on his receiver so far. Hollywood Brown is acting. Like he a receiver in the NFL. He, uh, look, I ain't taking shots into you until you show me something. But you are not a receiver that is going to get over the hump for this team. And it's probably, probably not even all his fault. Rashad Bateman right now, recall email. Come on, man. Like, you got a growing search. Here's the thing. Greg Roman, we haven't talked about that. Bottom 10 in passing. Every single year as an offensive coordinator. We're not even sure that the team, the philosophy, the system is going to allow Lamar Jackson to go out there and be Lamar Jackson, let alone the guys that they draft haven't hit for various reasons. But this is where, not comparable. This is where things are about to get tense, though, because I know what you're talking about. I've gotten that email, that recall email. But I've also done this, and I believe this is what you're doing. I believe this is what the Ravens are doing. Okay. I haven't been able to figure out a project, a product, right? I buy something, can't figure it out. So at the back, there's usually a customer service line. You dial up the customer Whoa. service line, you call customer you're service. Hey, me. I cannot figure this out. You're waiting, you're waiting, you're waiting. You finally tell them. And they say, well, did you read the user manual? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're like, no, no I, well, if you read the user manual, page one, there are actually pictures <laughs> and instructions of how to use it. Damn. You hang up, you look at the manual, and you yeah. realize it was user error. Eventually, the Ravens, again, walk by that mirror and say, Let's go. hmm, maybe it's user error. Because Hollywood Brown did not forget how to play football suddenly from the University of Oklahoma to... You sure? Are you sure? You're putting your life on that. I would, because Baker Mayfield was his quarterback in college, and he balled. Uh, That's I college. don't think, sure, but Lamar Jackson, we know at least we think, is better than Baker Mayfield. Yeah. So, if Lamar Jackson, your quarterback in the league, has upgraded from your quarterback in college, then I would assume you ain't just all of a sudden forget how to do what you knew what how to do. What's the system is better? Oklahoma in college, oh, oh, the Ravens in the NFL. Oklahoma, oh, but that on, is that not user error. Mm -hmm. That comes back to that's user error. Because you said what system. Yeah, yeah. It comes back to the system that the Ravens are running, but that's still the Ravens' fault. That's not an excuse. Well, it is an excuse. You know why? Because the players that we said that fit this system, all of a sudden, where are the batteries at? They ain't working? What's that? Is that, is that my, on me? Oh, See, it's funny. You call customer service. I never called him. <laughs> forever. <laughs> then you talk about you didn't read the manual. She told you page one. You page didn't even one. read page one, bro. They haven't. They, they Hollywood <laughs> Brown is a speedster. Page one of the manual. Hollywood Brown is a deep in. threat. Rah, rah. You, Lamar Jackson led the league in passing touchdowns. And you trying to tell me now that he can't throw? That's I what didn't you're say trying that. To, you're trying to imply I did that? not you try to say that. that. What I am implying is... If Lamar Jackson can run, which we know he can, he was number six in rushing guards last year. If Lamar Jackson can throw, which we know he can, he led the league in passing touchdowns two years ago, then what can't Lamar Jackson do? If Lamar Jackson can do everything, which I believe that Lamar Jackson can do, then where are the excuses at, big dog? I got, first of all, you, you keep going past the injuries like that doesn't matter. Acho. Were you at your best when you were hurt no, sir. or when you were healthy? Healthy, sir. Boy, that damn, how are they going to be at their best when they're hurt? Here is why. <laughs> oh, you know everybody in the league be hurt. Not at like this. At some point in time. Uh, uh, is Lamar in the league is traded away? Lamar hurt? Lamar ain't hurt. 
And Lamar's Lamar. the only piece that matters when there it really you go comes down story. to it. I'm talking reality, big dog. I love you for this. First of all, before you go to customer search, before you go to the manual, there's one page. You ever see that page? It's real colorful. It has lots of pictures. It's called Quick Start. If you go to the Quick Start, I love Quick Start. It means I know your ass lazy, and you ain't about to read this manual. You might call customer service. However, here's a step. Quick Start is what they're stuck on. They're stuck on Greg Roman, see your quarterback. He can run. Let's run the football. I understand what you're saying in terms of, hey, that's all internal, so that's still all on you. Mm -hmm. But then even internally, there are issues that are excuses if they don't go out there and get it done. They lost their number one running back. They're having injuries on defense at cornerback. You got receivers down, and you're acting like, oh, well, Lamar Jackson playing one on 11. He should be able to do that. To me, that's too much story, not enough of the reality. The reality for me is this. The Buccaneers were without players in the Super Bowl. We know the Chiefs were without players in the Super Bowl. Go back to a team I know best. And they got smoked. The Chiefs <laughs> did get smoked. And that's their excuse. But the, they used. But they were still in the joint. OK. They were still there. Lamar going to win. Lamar going to go 11 and 6. <laughs> 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 Lamar going to do what he do. It's just, is he going to get over the hump? If he doesn't, I'm here for you, Lamar, with all the excuses. The Packers season opens in just over a week, and things around Green Bay seem more kumbaya right now than ever. Now, the drama centered around Aaron Rodgers in the front office during the offseason. I guess things still subsided. Rodgers even posted a picture on Instagram, laughing with head coach Matt LaFleur, adding, quote, they said we wouldn't get along, close quote. Now, Brian Gutenkens talked about his current relationship with the reigning MVP. I'll take a listen. I've had really good conversations throughout camp uh, with Aaron and Matt, and and I think the communication has been really, really good. And so at the, as we went into this um, kind of decision-making period, I think, uh, you know, everybody, the, all the people that are kind of involved in that were um, very aware of what was going on and why we were doing what we were doing. So I feel really good about that, and um, the conversations that I've had with Aaron have been excellent. Go ahead. You know, don't want to be Aaron. What's your point, number? Let's go. Let's well, go. Uh -huh. is the Rodgers drama in Green Bay over? Hell no. Nah. You know it's not over. Oh, man. We're going to get a little philosophical mm -hmm. up here on this one. I'm going to tell people. I'm going to tell Aaron. I'm going to tell Coach. If you don't get rid of the illness, all you're doing is masking the symptoms. Now... The illness here is <laughs> Aaron Rodgers. Oh, you don't want to do a deep dive into what the real issues are with this team. Not in fullness. Um, it's easy when you're the MVP of a team. It's easy when you're the man on a team to look at everyone else and say, well, since they're lesser than me, then they must be the problem. I give you the parallel of Russell Wilson sitting there in the Super Bowl with Sierra and Roger Goodell and looking at Tom Brady. And when Russell Wilson realizes that, hey, I'm the best player on my team, and my team is not here, I can't be the problem. It must be something else. You catch that parallel. Well, we had that example play out in Green Bay as well. Now, when you don't address the illness and just mask the symptoms, what usually happens? There are stressors that bring that same illness back, which is going to show you them symptoms. Here we go. What happens when you face adversity? What happens when his team or Aaron Rodgers gets stressed again? What happens when Aaron Rodgers gets his back against the wall again? Is he going to address it properly, deep dive into himself and say, what am I doing wrong, as well as the collective? Or is he going to do what he did before? Start to point the finger at everyone else. We all know how they got sick. There was a draft. Oh, somebody left the window open. Catch that right there? Boy, I got these bars up here. All right, so they caught him. Oh, got the shivers over here. Aaron Rodgers said, hey, KBB. Somebody got to take care of my problems. This situation is just on pause. It's going to wait to a two-game losing streak if they have that. It's going to wait to Aaron Rodgers. Ooh, a little off the fastball of your MVP year last year. It's going to go when, boo, Jordan Love, whatever may happen, something's going to stress the situation. We're going to be right back to the moment we were all offseason. I love that take. Now, Sel, I am going to start my take off with one of the greatest Wiley-isms I've ever heard. Seriously? Top five? That's top five. It might be top two, but I've also learned that all Wiley-isms are really just borrowed quotes from other people. Damn right. Um, and then I make them half. <laughs> so <laughs> this quote what? from Marcellus Wiley or Nicola Machiavelli, <laughs> there is no avoiding war. Because it can only be postponed. Oh, yeah, yeah, 
But I like the way you say it. I better. say it better than War him. War cannot though. be avoided, only postponed. postponed. Damn right. The Packers have not avoided this war between Aaron Rodgers and management. Say it. They have just postponed it. Mm. So, no, the drama's not over because all they simply did was brush it under the rug and say, we'll talk about it later. Mm. Unless you address an issue at hand and truly give it a solution, like you said, with an illness, unless you actually find the cure, all you doing is postponing that war. It's coming back. It's coming back. Because you can't avoid it. Mm -mm. All you can do is delay it. Mm. So thus far, the Packers have only delayed the drama with Air, uh, Green Bay and Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers got a little bit of what he wanted. He got Randall Cobb in the offseason. I know he What'd wanted you say? to retain a player. What he got? He, he got, got what he, he got wanted. Him. He wanted Randall Cobb. <laughs> he did all this. He almost went to jeopardy over <laughs> Randall Cobb. Boy, stop. Let Boy, Randall Cobb was his third favorite receiver for the greater pass of five years. Yeah, I ain't gonna uh, maybe second. George Jordy Nelson, Randall Cobb. Are you marrying your third favorite girlfriend? No, I'm a third favorite. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you super single. You start to get there. Look, man, <laughs> I know this that much. Don't make no damn sense. With right you now, is. everything is good. Everything is Gucci. It's all love. Mm. But what are the Packers gonna do when Randall Cobb, who they went on a limb to sign, oh, because like remember Randall the Cobb. GM said like, hey, we wouldn't have signed him if not for Aaron Rodgers. What are they gonna do when he drops a pass? Ooh. What they gonna do when they're like, look, Aaron Rodgers, Ooh. now all of a sudden Randall Cobb just got hurt week one, and now we wasted a roster spot this offseason because of you. Ooh. What's Aaron Rodgers gonna do when it's fourth and goal, I don't know, say from the eight-yard line, and they decide to kick a field goal instead of going for Therefore, it? Go for it. What about when he doesn't want to run for it? And they could get the first... Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, we gotta bring in Fox NFL analyst Bucky Brooks. So, Bucky, is Aaron Rodgers' drama in Green Bay over? Uh, yeah, it's over because Aaron Rodgers realized he's on the losing side of the equation. Even though he comes and he got Randall Cobb, he doesn't really have anything that he can do to force the Green Bay Packers' hand. Because now that we're at the season, it is all on Aaron Rodgers. If Aaron, Ro Aaron Rodgers has to play great to continue to have the leverage that he has in his mind. Because he knows if he falls off, his backup is already right there ready to replace him. He also knows if he falls off, the destinations that he may believe are in his future, they may not be there anymore. So all of the drama has to go away because Aaron Rodgers has to focus on being the MVP again so he can put the pressure back on the Packers to do what he wants them to do. Because if he falls off, there's only one solution. He goes and plays somewhere else where the Packers determined he wants to play, not where Aaron Rodgers wants to play. So all the drama, all of the stuff that we had to deal with over the offseason, oh, no, Aaron Rodgers is back to being the good child because he doesn't have a choice. Man, I like that. I actually like that because Aaron Rodgers is now understanding what leverage really looks like and realizing he doesn't have the leverage in this conversation. I knew he never had the leverage from the beginning. I think Aaron Rodgers did as well, but a little smoke and mirrors can go a long way. However, it didn't go as long as he needed it. The Green Bay Packers are interesting as an organization. They don't have an owner. You got like a committee of 47 people all chiming in and stuff. So when you got ownership by committee, you're going to get some real out of that because there's wisdom of the crowd. So in those 47 people, somebody ain't going to be scared and be like, look, look, dog, I don't know. I, if there was one guy, you could convince him, Aaron Rodgers. But when it's 47 of them, they sitting there beating you up from all angles. Aaron Rodgers is getting beat up because of his playoff record. Aaron Rodgers is also getting beat up because of his performance in those same playoff games. I give it to you guys like this. Walk with me, y'all. Aaron Rodgers is 11-9 and nine in the playoffs. Aaron Rodgers is a little better than that in terms of being a winner. More importantly, they are 7-1 and one when Aaron Rodgers is Aaron Rodgers, passer rating over 105. They are 4-8 and eight when his passer rating is under 105. Let's dig deeper than that. Aaron Rodgers in NFC Championship games, y'all, is 1-4. Mm. Aaron Rodgers in those same NFC Championship games has a touchdown-to-interception ratio of nine touchdowns and eight interceptions. You mean for every touchdown you throw, you damn near throw a pick? Aaron Rodgers? Aaron Rodgers in NFC Championship games has a passer rating of 83. 83. So when you try to go out there and blast the organization, they sit near with this one tucked. Like, man, Aaron, you got to be careful because 
I need to see Acho right here because I've been getting biblical on him. I've been on him, my Donda. My Donda Kanye got me back in church, y'all. And I want to remind Acho that a lot of the Wileyisms, they really start from me. I'm about 55% of the Wileyisms, but the other 45% come from other great thought leaders and orators of this world. But here's the greatest of all, the King James LeBron version. A man's foes shall be his shall be in his own house. Let me clean that up and say it. A man's foes shall be in his own house. Your issues are inside you. Your problems are your own. A man's foes shall be in his own house. Aaron tried to blame them. He tried to throw rocks over there. And Green Bay was just looking at him like, are you sure? Because you don't want to go there. Well, look, I mean, I said that, and I agree with you, Marcel, it's on that point. Because we've seen Aaron Rodgers in the last two years be polar opposites. We've seen him at his best last year, where he was the MVP, and we saw him at, statistically, his career worst. Mm -hmm. And in both of those seasons, the Packers were 13-3. and three. So I ask you, how much is he really bringing to the table when it comes to their championship hopes? When I've seen him play at his best, they still get to the same destination mm -hmm. as I've seen him when he's at his worst. Mm -hmm. And so we, on the outside, have given him all this credit where we have made him the entirety of the Green Bay Packers organization when it's really not a true statement. Aaron Rodgers is a cog in the wheel, and the Packers need him to play better for them to get over the hump. If he is what we say he is, one of the guys who should have been in the conversation for GOAT status, then at some point he has to be able to get them over the hump. He hasn't been able to do that to this point, and at some point we're going to question his legendary status because he simply doesn't have enough rings uh, to justify uh, all the drama uh -oh. that has come along with it. Uh -oh. Somebody go join us in church. Uh. Somebody come to church. Come Bucky, on. I was, I was well rested, Bucky, and let me tell you why. I was well rested like because teasing the tease, I have to mentally prepare myself for this next topic of conversation because <laughs> I'm about to go in on this Kevin Durant slander of Steph Curry. So I was sitting here chilling, minding my business, letting you and Marcellus duke hate. this out. But then, Bucky, you said something. Uh-oh. You said Aaron Rodgers was a cog in the wheel. I'm smart, you're smart, sell smart, but I had to be an idiot because Aaron Rodgers was a cog in the wheel. It sounded like you said a cog in the wheel, he's just not necessary. So I had to Google what cog in the wheel meant while you was talking. <laughs> and cog in the wheel means <laughs> one who holds a minor but not necessary post. Now, Bucky, you don't woke me up. I was mm. chilling. I was trying to sleep. I was trying to prepare for the in next church? Night. But now, Bucky, you just call this man Aaron Rodgers a cog in a wheel, a minor but not necessary post Bucky Brooks. <clears throat> mm. I don't know your middle name. I would use it. You look like a Nathaniel. Bucky Nathaniel Brooks. That's what I'm going to call you. <laughs> you still look like a Nathaniel. You look like a Nathaniel. I knew Bucky I knew him. Nathaniel Brooks. <laughs> Aaron Rodgers had 26 tugs and four picks the year before his MVP season. While he did not have gross numbers, he had efficient numbers. I don't know what this segment has been about in Aaron Rodgers, Grama, and Green Bay, but you about to start some drama on this set mm. if you don't rescind the words that Aaron Rodgers was a cog in the wheel. Oh, he absolutely is a cog in the wheel. Because, see, you have to understand this, Archer. You didn't have an opportunity to play in what they call title town. Ooh. Meaning the Green Bay Packers existed before Aaron Rodgers. They're going to exist after Aaron Rodgers. Mm. The expectation is that mm. they win titles because that was set forth by the great Vince Lombardi. And when you go and you stand in that stadium and you look at the great, they're legendary, they're gold jacket players. And when gold jacket players come gold jacket expectations. And so if Aaron Rodgers is okay being comfortable knowing that he has fewer rings than Eli Manning, well, let that be said then. Because Eli Manning is only a bit player when it comes to the talent that Aaron Rodgers possesses. So we can blame the Green Bay Packers, but at some point we put this thing on quarterback. Because I've heard you talk about mm. Dak Prescott and others mm. in terms of how we judge them. Mm. And so if we're judging mm. Aaron Rodgers on gold jacket status, mm. oh, I don't know if we can walk into the Gosh. hallowed halls mm. of Canton and say that I am one of the greatest mm. when I only have one ring on my finger mm. and I have four losses in championship games. Lucky. I'm just saying. Back on have to. Um, William Eldridge. Brooks. 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 Junior. Yeah. Eldridge. I'm a name yeah. Clarence, though. <laughs> yeah. Real name yeah. Clarence. The highest paid player in a season in NFL history is Dak Rain. Prescott, $75 million he's making this year. Dakota is. Gotta love that. Dak's best season love that. was still not as good as Aaron Rodgers' worst season. Please do not mm -hmm. ever, ever, ever say that Aaron Rodgers is a cog 
in anybody's will. Aaron Rodgers is the Green Bay Packers as Aaron Rodgers is, as long as Aaron Rodgers is a Green Bay Packer. Let's make no mistake about that. Man. Anybody? Okay, I will tell you this. Aaron Rodgers is Donovan McNabb with a 12 jersey. Does that make you feel better? Because that's what I'm seeing. Because it, Donovan yeah. McNabb was uh, one and four was not, in I'm championship not, games, not, not, and it's the same yeah. thing. It is the same thing. If we're judging them on wins and what you accomplished, mm. he only has one ring, and he falters in the championship game over and over he, and over and again. Rodgers, MVP. At some point, we okay. got to call it space. It's space. Damn, just like Church. Can't do this also. It's going MVP. too long. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Pastor, the game about to start. You had me, Pastor, but now it's, it's time for kickoff. Uh, respect all that said. Well, the only thing I want to frame this with is Bucky did say it's title town. So you can't look at him like Donald McNabb. You got to look at him like, hey, in title town, you can't have the same amount of NFC championship wins as Rex Grossman. Jake DeHone. Of course, Tom Brady. Oh, in the NFC, Tom Brady only been there once. That's sad. Kevin Durant won two titles with Steph Curry while in Golden State, but he shares a locker room in Brooklyn with Kyrie Irving right now. KD has never shared away from the shied away from the social media, and that was apparent recently when former Nick Mike James, who Mike James created a buzz, posting Kyrie is more skilled than Steph and shoots better. Y'all hear that? You can see that KD liked the post that was in favor of Kyrie. So, I tell, I know you're going to have an issue with Kevin Durant doing this, do you? So, <clears throat> Kevin Durant is obviously one of the greatest basketball players of all time. But it's clear that Kevin Durant is trying to embody one of the greatest villains of all time. So, I was thinking about that quote. Remember Batman? Remember when Alfred was talking to Batman and he simply said that some people just want to see the bur world burn. This is what he said, actually. Some men aren't looking for anything logical like money. They can't be bought, bullied, reasoned, or negotiated with. Some men just want to watch the world burn. What I've realized, Cell, is that at a minimum, Kevin Durant just wants to watch some things in the basketball world burn. Because why would you bite the hand that feeds you? Mm. And Kyrie does the same thing. Y'all remember what Kyrie said when he joined the Nets about Bron Bron. He said, one thing I've always been comfortable with I felt like I was the best option every team I played for down the stretch. This is the first time in my career where I can be like that can make the shot too. Close quote. Now, it got me thinking, so. Kyrie without, I don't know, LeBron James, the best player he's ever played with, better than Kevin Durant, who would Kyrie be? I don't know, somewhere along the likes of basketball-wise. John Wall, a star, an all-star. But Kyrie, you wouldn't have that same clout, so why are you biting on the hand that feeds you? KD, biting on the hand that feeds you, big dog. Now, KD is one of the greatest basketball players of all time, but who would KD be without Steph Curry, the same man that he just showed a little bit of shade to? He would be, I don't know. Again, y'all saw the shade, but back to who KD would be, somewhere along the lines of Charles Barkley, one of the great sell, but would he really be the same KD without Steph Curry? So, sell, do I like it? Mm. I hate it. I absolutely hate it. Because mm. you don't bite the hand that feeds you, not Kyrie and not KD. And I'm tired of them wanting to watch the basketball world burn. Man. Oh, man, I love you. I hate the fact that you want Kyrie Irving to have less confidence in himself and use that against him. And I love Kevin Durant for going out there with his opinion-based facts or his factual opinion, however you want to cut it, and basically liking this tweet. You just put in more work going over there to that big board, coming back sweating, I see you, uh, versus him just double-tapping that little like button right there. It ain't that damn difficult, and it ain't that damn hard to see that he's telling the truth. Woo! I love this topic you right to here. There. Because, one, I love me some KD, but two, I love the respect that is being put on Kyrie's name. Let's break this down so many ways. Let's talk about what they're talking about. Who is more skilled? I ask you. Do you think it's really Steph Curry? Do Absolutely, you think it's Steph Curry. Curry. Absolutely? Yes, sir. Okay, let's break up. Guard down. Do whatever you want to do. Let's go. Do Who has better handles? Kyrie. Marcellus got the lead. Mm -hmm. Okay. Who is a better passer? 
I'm saying Steph Curry. Oh, you, you, <laughs> wait a minute. You've been saying everything up to this point. Now you got to say, I'm saying where I'm from in my psychology classes? That shows the insecurity, brother. I'm saying. You already been saying it. At that day, Marcellus is up 2 0 oh, because we know who the better passer is. And I actually have stats to support this, but I'm going to save the numbers until I hear you talk in conjecture. Who's the better shooter? Now, this is the one that's going to hit people in the head. Hit a drum again, Wiki. Huh. Who's the better shooter? I'm not answering that question. An idiotic question. You plead the ask. fifth? That's an idiotic How question. How are you going to win ask. this case and you pleading the fifth? Oh, boy. You because Steph say... Curry is the greatest shooter in the history of the NBA. So, of mm. course, he's a better shooter than Kyrie Irving. Mm. Okay. I will agree with that. However, this is way closer than people understand. Let's start with the one that's close, because the other two aren't. <laughs> Since 2016, I'm going to split his career in half, because I'm going to admit this. Kyrie, early career, figuring it out. LeBron there, 14, 15, all those years. Figuring it okay. out was the first round pick, top five. Hold on. I ain't, I'm talking about figuring out success, full success. And you know it didn't happen until he joined forces again with LeBron James. 2016, Kyrie, guess what his averages were? Same assist as Curry. Give you that. Who's shooting better since then? Who? I asked you. Oh, is it Steph from the field or is it Kyrie? Damn, you can't Google fast enough. It is actually Kyrie Irving who shoots better at 49% from the field versus Steph. Right there. But Steph is at 48%. Oh, let's talk about the last two years since you always want to say, Marcel, I don't want to hear your historical numbers. Okay, last two years, who's averaged more assists? <laughs> Who shot better from the field? <laughs> oh, my God. And the same exact at the free throw line. Boy, stop. KD liked this tweet this year. I'm going to you this year and last year and showing you that Kyrie is the more skilled basketball player. It's just that simple by the numbers. But I'm not going to take it away from Steph Curry on the shot, boy. The dude can shoot from the parking lot. And he is a better shooter. But in terms of overall skill, oh, it's Kyrie or Career. <clears throat> Let's talk career. Because what you want to do is start to pierce things down into in the last 27 days that started with the T. I got team. that stat here, too. Don't career. do it. Don't do it. Steph Curry averages 6.5 assists in his career. Kyrie Irving averages 5.7. Career. I told you, young. Steph Curry shoots 43% from three. Kyrie Irving shoots 39. Career. Steph Curry shoots 48% from the field. Kyrie Irving shoots 47. Career. Steph Curry averages 24. Excuse me. Ooh, 24 points per game. Kyrie Irving oh, averages 22. Oh, you want to do that? Okay. Now, I got these two. If Kyrie leads the league in something, it's lead the league in games missed because somebody called him an word. Steph Curry led the league in points, not once, but twice. You want to hear that Steph word? Steph Curry led the league in steals. <laughs> so you can't come up here and tell I'm me that Kyrie Irving is a better player than Steph. Stop. But it's not even about that. What it's about for me is the disrespect, Sal. Well, how is that disrespectful? He it's was there. It's disrespectful for Kevin Durant to look at Steph Curry, who gave Kevin Durant Two chips. He the gave him after losing to that 73-win team? The, he uh, gave he, him something? He what did he give him? He gave him. He begged him to no. come. He gave him the opportunity Begging? at NBA championships, two of which they won. He gave them the opportunity at NBA Finals MVP. He did? Two of which he got. Yes. Why he couldn't do it without him Durant, the, the, that year? He did it the year before. He didn't do it the year he was begging. So, I love without you. Steph Curry, does Kevin Durant have an NBA title? I don't know. I don't know. I know. Because Steph Curry has... Yeah, Kevin Durant had 10 opportunities or so, eight opportunities, before Steph Curry to get an NBA title. Yeah, yeah. He won I once. That. I get that. He lost two. Oh, That's not the answer to that question, though. Bro. It is. No, it's because not. Because the answer to the question is this. Respect. Kevin Durant... I ain't got a lie for your respect, some, though. Res it's not a lie. If, if, if I play with two dudes and you ask me which one, and you think you're already... See, this is your problem. This is Wolf's people's problem. They already think they know the answer. I tell my wife all the time, you do this problem, too. <sighs> Let me get my composure. Most people don't listen. They're just waiting to talk again. Of course, that's true. And I'll be like, damn. So when someone come up to me and they say, I, I played in Dallas. Emma Smith or Barry Sanders? I was like, y'all don't want to hear this in Dallas, do y'all? Okay. And I had to have arguments. I was like, what the hell are we doing here? In this conversation, he played with both guys, right? I'm trusting him a little bit more. I hear this all the time. Marcellus, you the co-host killer. You've been with so many co-hosts. Who's your favorite? Who's the more skilled? Who's the best? And it ain't always the answer they think. Is it you? It's right you. <laughs> Shut up. Because you work with nah, you know you're a genius and you're wordsmith. The point is, can you trust Kevin Durant? The problem is you don't trust Kevin Durant, so now you think he's being disrespectful. Here's the problem. 
we can remove our emotional state and simply okay. look at the empirical data of it all. Okay. Who has more points per game in their career? Okay. Steph Curry. Yeah. Who shoots a higher percentage from the field? Steph Curry. Who shoots a higher percentage from three? Steph Curry. Wonderful. Who shoots a higher percentage from the free throw Keep line? On. Steph Curry. Who averages more assists? Steph Curry. Who's led the NBA in steals? Steph Curry. Steph Curry. Who has more turnovers Literally. per game? Who has more turnovers then? You want to keep going? Take I that. Got, oh, that, that. Take that. But who <laughs> take that, take that. literally <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. is better who has more at blocks just per game? about who every better quantifiable category? Because what we do, the only oh, thing Kyrie quiet. Irving has Steph Curry in is things that are subjective. What is subjective? Oh, about who got turnovers? better handles? Kyrie Irving. Subjective. Kyrie I don't have a I don't have a you don't have a statistic that can prove that. You don't have a, I do have a, ha a crossovers per game. I, How many dudes got crossed up? <laughs> yeah, I do. No, I got a bloopers reel of ankles getting broken. That's what I do. Why you don't want to talk about the stats I got? Career stats that are top, Kyrie. Hey, that also the, speak to the defense. Give me the career side. stats you have. Every time we talk about oh, the Nets, you always talking about the defensive issues. But then when we talk about defensive numbers, you don't want to talk about Go it. Go ahead. Because Kyrie got those. I ain't gonna bore people with defense because I know nobody gives a damn. Turnovers per game, blocks per game, etc. Here's the thing that I also notice: uh, seven-time All-Star, All-Star Game MVP. Steph, any other? Steph, Steph won a Finals MVP. <laughs> Kyrie. No, because they gave it to LeBron because LeBron deserved it. But guess what? Who had the biggest play in that series? The block, LeBron James. The shot. Ky this is the point. No one respects Kyrie. Sell. The, without the, 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 the shot, shot, at least it might still be tied and what, who knows what's going to happen. You said a lot to say a little. Here's the thing. If I know that Kyrie don't make that shot, block all you want if you are LeBron James. Even if he don't make the Look shot, it's still right a here, tie game. It's still a the, tie oh, who is, game. Who is that guarding him? Who, okay, wait a minute. Without I know we're in slow-mo, but I need to see that a little. Here who my is thing, guarding big dog. Kyrie Here my for thing. the biggest shot in finals history? Without the <laughs> shot, <laughs> it's still a tie game. Oh, oh. Still a tie I game, I don't want to do your math with you. Let's keep it over here but, in English let's, let's keep let's it in English, English class. class. I don't want to go to math. Who got more steals per game in their career? Who the Steph better Curry. Steph Curry. It's not close. I'll give you that. You <laughs> <laughs> but that ain't the question. More skilled. Look, this is real. Uh, Jadavian Clowney, not better than me. Not yet. Uh, he, he, but he got more skills than me. I give him that. Like, okay. I, I, like skills is like the, the, the means to an end. I see what the, and uh, the end... You're going Steph, somewhere. You're going somewhere. I, you're going somewhere. I'm not a liar. Steph Curry at the end is better than Kyrie. But the way to get there, take me doing... Ky I want to go down Kyrie Boulevard because damn them handles, damn that shot, damn that clutch. But when you driving down Kyrie Boulevard and you turn right... And you hit the Kyrie Boulevard, what you see is it says this, dead end. When you're going down Steph Curry Road, it leads to chip. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. plural. Yeah, so Kyrie yeah. does have better handles, but if Kyrie had more skill, wouldn't his skill translate? No. Wouldn't it translate into, I don't know, a scoring title like Steph Curry's did? Wouldn't it translate into, I don't know, MVPs like Steph Curry's did? Wouldn't it translate into, I don't know, at least leading the league in some category like steals like Steph Curry did? Wouldn't it translate into, I don't know, first-team MVPs like Steph Curry has or first-team All-NBAs? Wouldn't it translate into something? All this skill and you ain't got nothing to show for no, it? No, he got something to show for it. Let's not do that. Let's not get extreme up here. Here's the thing. Um, a lot of basketball players tell me this. I don't know if they go on record. They may. They say Kobe Bryant's probably the most skilled basketball player there. That's fair. Seen, right? That's yes, fair. Sir. Is he the best basketball player ever? Most people don't have him in their top ten. Even if you do, is he the best basketball player ever? No. Michael Jordan's better than Kobe, but they would say Kobe had more skills. That's all I'm saying. Kyrie got more skills than Steph. Steph's just a better shooter, and that's the equalizer. That just kind of knocks nine of uh, Kyrie's Fair, skills off but the it's, board. But it's twofold. Now you're going somewhere I don't think I've seen the show go before. Let's go. <clears throat> Michael Jordan is better than Kobe Bryant in particular because Michael Jordan came first. You feel me? Like, I feel that. Yeah, first yeah, yeah, off, yeah. like, the first song. We, bro, yeah. we was just talking about this during commercial break, y'all. Kanye West. I knew you were going to rock with this new Kanye album. It does nothing for me. I love but Marcel has made a good point. He was like, the reason you like the old school Kanye songs, like all of the likes, et cetera, was because they came first. Mm -hmm. So if we are going to talk about the late great emphasis on great Kobe Bryant, yeah. the reason he's not viewed in perception as as great was he was a remix. Yeah, yeah, he was yeah. a remake, right, if right. you will. He was the second version of Michael Jordan. And Michael Jordan has more chips. Mm -hmm. But when you're looking at Steph Curry and Kyrie Irving, Steph is the original. He was no remake. Now, Trey Young might be a remake of Steph, I feel but that. Steph is the original. I feel that. Kyrie Irving is a very skilled player. The difference for me is his skill does not translate into what Steph Curry's skill has translated. Okay, and 
I think this is an issue. When people ask a question, when you ask the question, you want to already give another answer. We didn't ask you who's better. We say who's more skilled. When we go to the combine, Mike Mamula, you remember Mike Mamula? Purists know him, early 90s, mid 90s, destroyed the combine at defensive end. Got picked number seven overall because of his combine. One of the most skilled performances we've ever seen. People were on record saying that's the most skilled we've ever seen a defensive end perform. Was he a good to great player? No, because skill doesn't always translate. But we're still going to have a conversation in a vacuum. Who is more skilled? But here, Can we stay still let's stay in the vacuum? That. Yes, sir. I will, I will stay in Don't the vacuum. Don't go better. I'm in, the, I'm in the vacuum. Skilled. If someone was a more skilled runner, they would be faster. If someone was a no, more... that's not true. Because some people have perfect form and they slow. <laughs> you ever seen no, that dude? That, that, that's them. not skill. That's well, what's form. Well, okay. Like if you gonna sit here and talk to me about this combine guy, he might be more athletic. But Steph Curry is skilled because his skill translates. Don't talk to me about who's flashier. Kyrie's flashier. I'll if give no you that no too. Flashy, I, give you that. I give you flashy. Mm -hmm. But I cannot give you skill because Steph Curry is skilled at getting the ball into the hoop. Well, look. I ain't gonna lie to you because you're my dog. And we talk off mic better than we talk on camera. I'm a little biased in this one. You know, Kyrie, my dog. You know, me and Kyrie was just hooping it up a few days ago. I mean, Carmelo was there, too, and the man in the middle. <laughs> Respect. I know you somebody. I just wasn't checking it out. But if you really want to know how me and Kyrie get down, who that in the background? Who that in the background? It's your boy. Shout out to St. Monica High School Hall of Fame right there. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, brother. 49ers start their season against the Lions in just over a week, but we still don't know if Jimmy Garoppolo or Trey Lance will be the starting quarterback. Kyle Shanahan is not giving up his choice. Mm. Even close to the best. He was asked this morning about it and said, quote, you'll just have to see it on Sunday. Acho, if we make it to Sunday, remember you said that a few weeks ago. All right, so Acho, this dude, who should the 49ers start week one, Jimmy G or Trey Lance? I'm going to say Trey Lance, and I'm going to say Trey Lance because rip the Band-Aid off, and let's go ahead and get going. Say it with your chest, though. Do that again. Uh, be well, I can't say it with my chest Why? because I understand both sides. Jimmy okay. G is one of the winningest quarterbacks percentage-wise of all time. Now, percentage can always skew stats because it's based off limited exposure and opportunities. But Trey Lance is going to be the future. Trey Lance is going to be the guy. And more than anything, Trey Lance already proved to you why you drafted him so early. Talk he proved in the preseason his running ability at times. More than that, he proved in the preseason the strength of his arm. He made throws that mm. many doubt, and I would also doubt, that Jimmy G can make. Jimmy G made throws, or the lack thereof, that I know Trey Lance can make. So for that reason, if I'm looking at it, what's the point in playing Jimmy G week one? What's the point in starting Jimmy G week one? Mm. You know how it's going to end. You know how it's going to go. Just go ahead and do it. Oh, man, I'm going to say it with my chest. It should be Jimmy G. Jimmy G is a winner. I'm talking about next... I'm not even talking about, like, typical next-level winner. And last time I checked and last time I listened to you, Kyle Shanahan, certainly before the draft, you told me that, hey, we just got to go out there and get something because Jimmy G has been hurt. This is no slight to Jimmy G in terms of performance. This was just based on reliability. But last time I checked, Jimmy G is healthy right now. So let's use this winner up. Because I know who Jimmy G is. The question is, do I know who Kyle Shanahan is without Jimmy G? Full screen right now. It's been a minute. Got to go to who my man Kyle Shanahan is. Look at your record overall. That's including Jimmy G. Look at Jimmy G, what he does to your record. Hook you up. And then look at the bottom. Damn. Any other quarterback. That's not named Jimmy G. Seven wins and 27 losses. Good Lord. If I'm Trey Lance, I'm kind of scared to be the starting quarterback because I could fall into that third category, seven and 27. But I will say this. I'm not going to cook the logic and cook the books. None of those quarterbacks are Trey Lance. So I understand that Kyle Shanahan wants this opportunity in this runway going forward. Must I remind you, though, who Kyle Shanahan is over the last 20 seasons? With his winning percentage, he's only one of 13 coaches that made it to a sixth season. Why? Because you usually don't live that long when you have a record like that. And I'm talking about the Todd Bowles, Gus Bradley's, Mike Shannon. This is where he put himself in position. And you have a winner, a genie in a bottle by the name of Jimmy G, and you don't want to let that go week one? I thought the name of the game was to win. So uh, let's do it like this. Let's do it like let's this. Go. Flip the question on his head. And if you're Jimmy G, do you want to start week one? 
Because if I'm Jimmy G and I know that my days here are numbered, yeah. let me go ahead and number my days. Mm. You're going to get the Wiley as well. Like, good. if I'm Jimmy G and I know at the end of the day I'm about to be up out of here, uh, then what am I still being a placeholder for? If I know I'm about to get broke up with, just go ahead and break up with me. Don't sure? just... Always? If I know for a know? fact I'm getting broken up Tiff with... Oh. Just go ahead. Uh-oh, you got a story. Uh, no, 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 I'm going off the story. No, 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 I'm married now. I got to forget about Tiffany. Uh, so keep going. <laughs> <laughs> if I know I'm gone, let me go ahead and be gone. So flipping the question on his head even, Jimmy G shouldn't want to start week one. Why? Because he's not going to be starting by week 17. Which he's not going to be starting by week always. He already auditioned, and his audition was amazing. 22 and 8 as a starter. You audition and you healthy. I go out there week one, I run the chance of getting hurt. I really run the chance of getting hurt because I know there's pressure on me. You saw Jimmy G. In the preseason, he ran the ball in for a touchdown and got his head and shoulder yeah, crunched yeah, in that. You shouldn't do this in the regular season if your team's starting quarterback, unless it's the Super Bowl and it's the fourth quarter and this is the last drive with the game on the line. This is not advisable by anybody. But because Jimmy G got pressure from Trey Lance, he got to go out there and act reckless to make sure he can do everything he can to maintain his starting position. That's not safe nor healthy for Jimmy G. You know your days are numbered. Number your days. Get on out of there. I love that. That's going to be a Wileyism. Respect to you, and I'll give you your credit. Unlike you on Twitter sometimes when you stole my grandma tweet. Bruh. You, you ever do that again, dog? Let me try and get that shine off my grandma. She gone. And here's the thing. Respect to you. Not respect to Kyle Shanahan when Jimmy G ain't the quarterback. You keep talking about Jimmy G that took him to the Super Bowl. Last year, Jimmy G was banged up, hurt. That's not good tape. You want to go back out there in the regular season and show them you're still that guy, but I do respect what you're saying. Do you respect the team, though, without Jimmy G that has finished 20th or worse in scoring, and they have a guru, a genius, as a head coach that used to be an offensive coordinator? I don't. And if I'm Trey Lance, i got to be careful because if you look at Trey Lance in two of his three games in the preseason, under 50% in terms of completion percentage. We know he can run the football. Can he throw the football at the NFL level? Day one. That's the conversation right here. You got a winner in Jimmy G. Don't be too cute with it. Start the winner and let's roll. The Justin Fields era in Chicago, well, it appears to be on pause. Andy Dalton has been named the starter, while the first round pick will have to sit for now. Now, general manager Ryan Pace defended the decision, saying, quote, ain't no need to rush. Justin out there, close quote. Now, Marcellus, do you agree with the Bears that there's no need to rush Fields? No, I don't like this at all, especially the framing of this. Um, I hate when people try to, like, frame something to act like they helping you. They hooking you up. They looking out for you. That's real. When you don't even know what I'm capable of, that projection is just nasty to see this from Matt Nagy. Takes me to that, what, that scene in Pursuit of Happiness from Will Smith was yelling at his son. Because he only talked about what he went through and what he capable of, not what the boy was able to do and not what Justin Fields is able to do. Man, Nagy, man, you like post-traumatic stress from all them bad quarterbacks you've been evaluating. You can't even see a good one when it's right in your face. Oh, I get mad with this. Coach used to be like, why do you can't do that? I'm like, bro, let me, let me show you I can do that. Rush? That's the word we're going to use, rush. When I see at least three other rookie quarterbacks that's going to start week one, and you're going to say it's a rush to put me out there? Oh, is it a rush for Trevor Lawrence? Is it a rush for Zach Wilson? Is it a rush for who? Mac Jones? Nobody's framing it that way over there. You know why? Because it ain't no rush. Bro, I got drafted in April. <laughs> I'm ready for this moment. We ready. What? As we say in the locker room, you don't think I can do it? Put the weight on there. Let me show you what I could do. But Coach Matt Nagy, you over there trying to frame it like you looking out. Uh, so I, I don't have an issue, and I agree with Matt Nagy on this one. Now, it's a couple reasons. You saw. The first is Matt this, Phil. Right no, I look at logic. Last four mm -hmm. NFL MVPs, Tom Brady, mm -hmm. Lamar Jackson, mm -hmm. Patrick Mahomes, Aaron Rodgers, not in that order, obviously. None of them were rushed onto the field as rookies. Aaron Rodgers, he backed up Brett Favre. Lamar Jackson sat behind Flacco. Patrick Mahomes, he sat behind Alex Smith. Tom Brady, we know the story of him and Drew Bledsoe. Now, clearly, at least two of those four were better than the starters at the time. But there was no need for them to run out there on the football field because you played a long game. And don't ever let a short-term goal undermine your long-term achievement, mm. period. And what Matt Nagy is looking at is, I'm not going to let this short-term goal of trying to win here and now undermine my long-term goal of trying to win for much longer. Mm. Realistically, it's like this. Mm. 
With Justin Fields, the Bears are a fringe playoff team. I think they make it in the playoffs. Okay. With Andy Dalton, the Bears are a fringe playoff team. I don't think they make it in the playoffs. Mm. Either way, they are a fringe playoff team this year that might win one playoff game, might not. So why undermine Justin Fields' long-term success for trying to win an extra two or three games right now? Look, we're all survivalists. We all act like we all looking out for each other when we are all looking out for ourselves in different ways. Mm -hmm. I always remind you, what's in common between someone who is selfish and someone who is selfless? Self. You keep talking about the long game for some coaches that are on the hot seat right now, and a general manager that's on the hot seat. So how long is the game for them if they ain't gonna be there that long? <laughs> it ain't gonna be that long. But mm, we gonna pull a parachute and call it Justin Fields if we go through some rigors, mm -hmm. through some struggles with Andy Dalton. It's senseless because, one, put out there what's the best for you and what's ready. When you're a rookie in the NFL, it's so funny quarterback position, how we evaluate it differently. If you're the best defensive tackle, they putting you out there, hello. If you're the best defensive end, they putting you out there, hello. They know there are going to be growing pains. What's wrong with him taking his growing pains right now? Because you keep saying we're playing a long game. The game is the longest when I get to play the first week all the way through week 17 in games. It's not going to be long when you're saying, well, it worked for all the other former MVPs, so let's, ju let's just go out there and do that. Here's the thing. I don't have that situation. I don't have that setup. Those situations are way different. Joe Flacco was making some money. Drew Blesser was making a oh, $100 million contract. We ain't getting rid of them. You talk about a Brett Favre situation, stop playing. Like, this is Andy Dalton, dog. He went 4-5 or five last year with the Cowboys. He wasn't even on your team. The year before that, he was 2-11. and 11. There's nothing marrying you to Andy Dalton. Same thing with the Cam Newton situation. That's what this mirrors, and Mac Jones is starting over there, and Justin Fields need to be starting in Chicago. So there is at times, though, I'll start it like this. Let's go. Every draft class has several busts at quarterback and a few to make it. It's going to happen. But typically, it's more busts than it is ballers. Mm. If you the Bears, why run the risk of expediting Justin Fields potentially being a bust? Because you go out there, throw him out there early. I think they yeah. open against the Rams. Somebody check me if I'm wrong in my ear. Open against the Rams, Jalen Ramsey, Aaron Donald, and them dudes. Number yes. one defense in the league last year. Let Andy Dalton take them lashes, big dog. I don't want to have Justin Fields to take them lashes for the same reason as, like, Justin Fields, bruh, I want to ease you in slowly. I don't want you to have to take these beatings. Andy Dalton, he's already going to take a beating. He's been taking a beating his whole career. He played in Cincinnati. Let him take the beating. When I bring you in, I want to usher you in gracefully. Mm -hmm. Yep, he got to you. He got to you. Who Matt Nagy got to you. Damn it. Look how you are framing this. You didn't say rushing. You said run them in there, because I know you were like, Marcellus is kind of triggered right now with the rush word. But I get what you're saying. Here's the thing. Tom Coughlin kind of made highlights with this, and this became an issue. Y'all trying to frame it like being on time, you got to be early. And this situation on time is week one. That's not early. That's on time. If you're not ready in week one and you a top quarterback and you ready, you're kind of late. So I don't understand why we're trying to frame it like that. I couldn't play for Coughlin. Five minutes early is on time. Boy, stop. Raiders GM Mike Mayock said he and John Gruden will, quote, both tell you what we feel like we need to be a playoff team this year. Owner Mark Davis was told about this comment and said, quote, it's always nice to hear somebody say that, but let's go out and do it. I'd be much more impressed if they did it. Bow, bow. So, Acho, are the Raiders putting pressure on John Gruden? Yes, and finally, Sel, um, John Gruden has had a 64 and 80 64 and 80 records since 2003, since the Super Bowl appearance. 64 and 80. Better Not just a losing coach, yeah. a absolutely <laughs> losing head coach. Um, beyond that, John Gruden, you're supposed to be an offensive guru, big dog. But you ain't guru in the offense. <laughs> like, I just, that don't make no sense to me. Derek Carr has gotten worse since you showed up. Uh -uh. Okay, I'm Derek Carr had MVP votes before John Gruden showed up. Derek Carr went to three. nice last year, He went to three consecutive Pro Bowls before John Gruden showed up. Pro Bowls hard, brother. In AFC? He ain't sniffed the Pro Bowls. The AFC? No, it's not. No, it's not. It's dregs of the That's where they He ain't sniffed the Pro Bowls since. John Gruden said, dude had a whole... Didn't he have a whole quarterback show on a network? No, that was a great show. And then you show up, and you can't quarterback... Well, Your own quarterback? He didn't get those quarterbacks. He got Derek Carr, but still Derek Carr Derek good. Carr was a... He was good until good. John Gruden showed up. Um, <laughs> but more importantly than this, don't talk to me about the contract, the $100 million, because at this point, it's a sunk cost. 
is a sunk cost. You already paid him the $100 million. You're, on, you're tethered to the $100 million. So you shouldn't stay in the relationship with John Gruden because you've already paid the $100 no. mil. No. You may stay in your relationship so you bought the engagement ring. <laughs> It was some cost. You said, ring already bought. Ring I ain't bought. getting the money back. I'm not going to stay in a relationship because of a ring. Yeah. Don't stay in a relationship yeah. with this man because of no money. Mm, Chucky, get him. Ah, Charles Lee Ray going to come out of him, boy. Um, look, they're putting something on him. I, don't, I wouldn't call it pressure because a $100 million investment, 10-year investment, that's a runway. That's a lot of time. Uh, however, what you're not understanding is why they gave him that much time in the first place. Where is he coaching? You got to remember, this is not his first time in a Raiders organization. So the first time he was there, he realized, okay, I got some success here. You know, this is a good team. Oh, man, they traded me away. And what were they between his two tenures? The Raiders have been and played in one playoff game between Chucky tenures. One! Every other team in the NFL, name another sorry team, Jacksonville, go ahead. Name another sorry team before Legend, Cleveland, go ahead. Has played in multiple games in the playoffs except one organization, the Raiders. So now Chucky is there to save the day. Guess what? It takes some time to save the day. I know Superman makes it le look easy, but when you're looking at John Gruden, it takes time. Have they improved in their wins every single year he's been there? Acho, Mike? Yes. Yes. So now we're starting to see the next step is getting over the hump and into the playoffs. What Mark Davis just basically said is, look, talk is cheap. Get there. And I believe you can get there because if I didn't believe you could get there, I wouldn't give you a 10-year, $100 million deal to go and get it done. Make a lemonade up here.